Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Scott Sinclair. I'm the Senior Manager of Programs here at Cancer and Careers, and I am so glad to have you here this afternoon. Uh, for those of you who are listening in on your phone, please uh, let us know by sending an email to cancerandcareers at cew.org with your name and the phone number that you're dialing in from. That way we can confirm your attendance and make sure that you receive all of the relevant information and materials following the webinar. If this is your, if this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, Cancer and Careers is a nonprofit and, one of, and the only program of its kind solely dedicated to empowering and educating people with cancer to thrive in their work environment. All of the programs and services that we offer are provided free of charge. Our comprehensive website, available in both English and Spanish, is the heart of everything we do. There you can find various support services, including our resume review service and access to career coaches. We also have a collective diary as a place to share your feelings, thoughts, and ideas that may help and inspire and validate other visitors to our site. Our educational blog and news feed are both rich resources for those who've been diagnosed, their caregivers, employers, and healthcare professionals, where they can stay current on topics related to work and cancer. Additionally, our publication library provides tangible, easy to digest information on working and looking for work after a cancer diagnosis. Titles are available in both English and Spanish, and they can be ordered and downloaded from our website free of charge. We also offer a number of free events throughout the year, both hour long webinars like this one, as well as full day events. And I'll be back to tell you more about these at the end of today's presentation. Now, a few key things related to accreditation. And for those of you who do not need this, uh, please bear with me. I'll try to make this as fast as possible. Today's virtual web webinar is accredited for CEs by the Association for Social Work Board, the New York State Education Department State Board for Social Work, the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation, and the California Board of Registered Nursing, and is accredited for PDCs for HR professionals by SHRM. If you plan on receiving continuing education credits for this program from any of these accrediting bodies, please proceed with the following steps. First, you must log in or call in individually. Participants who listen in on someone else's line will not receive credit. Second, with, uh, within two weeks of this event, you must complete uh, a evaluation as well as receive a passing test, passing score of 80% or higher on the post-test. The link to the evaluation and the post-test will be shared uh, no later than tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern time. All this information can be found in more detail on, the, on our website. Now, as you know, Zoom has a lot of great features which you can interact with us and other attendees. If you have any questions about today's content, please submit them in the Q&A box. Uh, we know the importance of privacy, so there is the option to submit questions anonymously, and we'll do our best to answer everyone's questions, but please be patient. If we don't get to you today, uh, please shoot us an email at cancerandcareers at cw.org, and we'll make sure we get you an answer to your question. You'll also see a chat box in the features panel. Our goal is to keep you engaged with the content as possible. Just a thing to note is that the chat box is not private and will show your first and last name. So that's something to be mindful of when or if you engage in the chat. Uh, and if you're experiencing any technical issues, please visit the link on this slide to access, our, to access our instructions guide, or you can contact Zoom directly by phone or email. Thanks in part to direct support from Genentech and QVC, Cancer and Careers is able to offer this ninth year of our Balancing Work in Cancer webinar series. This program was created to provide patients and survivors, as well as their care teams and in their employers, with concise, targeted information about the work-related issues that arise after a cancer diagnosis. Additionally, we'd like to recognize Cancer and Careers' as year-long sponsors who support all of our core programming and allow us to continue providing all of our resources and services free of charge. Now, many of you are aware of the pressure and stress of job hunting. Looking for a new job during or after cancer treatment can feel overwhelming, but we want to make sure, we want to help you see that it's possible and manageable. Our goal is to make sure that you're well prepared as you apply for a job. Today, we'll focus on the tactics to make you successful and effective in your job search. 
In this session, you'll learn tips on creating an effective resume, how to ace the interview, including additional questions about a gap on your resume, which I know a lot of you probably have questions about. To take us through this topic, I'm thrilled to introduce Julie Jansen. Julie is a speaker, trainer, coach, and author who's helped thousands of professionals find success and satisfaction at work, as well as find work that's gratifying. She's written two books, but most importantly to us, Julie is one of our original coaches here at CAC, and she's helped patients and survivors with their individual employment challenges. Following Julie's presentation, uh, there'll be time for questions. So again, drop those in the Q&A box located either at the top or the bottom of your screen. Uh, and a reminder that uh, don't put the questions in the chat box as we might miss them there. So you wanna put them in the Q&A box. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Julie. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. Oh, where'd you go? There, there's me. Okay, here I am. <laughs> so um, this is a big topic. And I've talked about it a lot, and no doubt maybe some of you have heard me speak about it. Um, it's, as Scott said, job search is really tough for everybody who does it for many reasons. And on top of this, there's unique challenges that cancer patients and survivors face during the process. Um, I've been a volunteer career coach, resume reviewer, and presenter for Cancer and Careers for nearly 17 years, believe it or not. And I've drawn upon this experience and the questions that we commonly receive um, on resume writing and job search in general to customize this presentation as much as possible for you, packing in a lot of content in a short period of time. And, and Scott also mentioned, we will have some time for Q&A. So I always like to start out with some information about the job market, the current job market, and what this means to you in your specific situations. And then we can uh, dig into the specific things that you can do to prepare for your job search. And then finally, we'll dig into the tactical elements of looking for a job. So the pandemic turned the work world completely upside down, as you're well aware, both positively and in some ways not so positively. What is great is there are many options for job seekers to find remote, hybrid, and part-time jobs, contract jobs, freelance jobs. And even if a job posting doesn't address um, what types of working conditions, as in remote or hybrid, you should definitely always ask about it and try to negotiate this. Um, despite continued layoffs in certain sectors, companies are still struggling to find employees, and they recognize that there is an employee pool called hidden workers. Um, however, they haven't really figured out how to access them. So if you fall into that pool of hidden workers, and I'll, I'll define it a little bit more for you in a few moments, then it's up to you to try to figure out how to find your, make yourself known um, to potential employers, um, not always the traditional way by applying online. Um, it's estimated there's, a, there's about 27 million people in the United States who are viewed as hidden workers. Those are people who fall into a couple narratives. One is people are working part-time, but could or would work full-time. Um, people who've been unemployed for a long time and they're seeking employment. And then people who just aren't working, they're not currently looking for work, but they could be convinced to seek work if the right circumstances were to present themselves. So some examples, um, which will be familiar to you, are caregivers, people with chronic long-term temporary health diagnoses, veterans, immigrants, people with disabilities, relocating spouses and partners, people without um, degrees or traditional qualifications, and even people who have been incarcerated. So the barriers that you may face if you fall into any of these categories is an inability to balance your needs with work, such as the needs being flexibility, hours, benefits, and accommodation. It could be lacking qualifications or skills. It could be your mindset. You're feeling um, intimidated or lacking confidence or discouraged, not knowing where or how to really look for a job because it does feel like a very onerous process um, or not having the time or money to invest in training and education. Um, it's important for you to think about whether any of those obstacles are perceived in your mind or others, or you know, specifically something that you can get your arms around with the right help. Um, layoffs are continuing primarily, I would say, in tech, financial services, 
consulting and other disparate sectors. But the good news is that of April, as of April of 2023, which is just really kind of a month ago, there were 10.1 million open jobs in the United States, um, which means there's still, if you do the math, something like 1.9 job openings per every available worker. So let's move on to the next slide and talk about some of the things that um, we need to think about. The, a job search is absolutely like riding a roller coaster, um, mentally and emotionally. And it's particularly easy to default to the negative, such as uh, an example being, I'm not getting interviews because no one thinks I'm qualified. Um, confidence is crucial in life, of course, and it's really crucial in a job hunt. Um, so keeping your confidence bolstered is important so that even if you're faking it, which is okay, you could present a self-assured persona and deal with what seems like criticism and certainly is rejection at times. Um, you don't get as much positive feedback. I mean, I've asked a lot of people, you know, when you got, they got hired for a job, did you ever ask why you were hired? And most people never, never ask that question. And that's a positive angle, you know? Um, so thinking about your unique background and the experiences that shaped you and your notable traits and the value you bring will help you in bolstering your confidence, giving yourself credit for things, for past effort and past successes, creating a positive mantra that you can say to yourself when you're feeling your confidence sink, um, taking risks, um, using assertive language, asking for specific feedback from some of your former employers or your colleagues about your strengths and really, really important, not a, not a great strength of mind, but be patient. People with cancer tend to be extremely hard on themselves and hold an exceedingly high bar for what people should expect of them and what they expect of themselves, or I should say what you expect of yourselves. We get questions about disclosure all the time. This is a very personal choice for you to make. It's important that you think through how you might manage reactions or responses to your disclosure, as well as how it may impact your candidacy for, for jobs. And, um, this is, this is a funny uh, analogy, but if you think of the steps of a job search are quite similar to dating, um, it probably isn't a good idea to overshare the details of your last bad breakup on your first date. And so considering what you would reveal and when, when you're going through the interviewing process or even the, jo you know, the job search process is very, very important. And really just sitting down and carefully thinking about that and running it by some of your advisors. Okay. So moving on to the next slide, um, before you start your job search, I'm constantly surprised by how few people are aware of their expenses beyond rent or a mortgage. Um, there's always plenty of non-essential expenses that you can cut down or eliminate altogether. When I think of how long it took me to end my cable service and move to streaming and save tons of money, I wonder why I procrastinated this for so long. It just seemed like a huge process. Um, get professional help, cancer and careers that, you know, Scott mentioned a, a number of the services, they're phenomenal and I'm a little biased, but, um, ask a career coach, which I occasionally weigh in on, and the resume review service, which I essentially do every week and have for since it started. Um, just take advantage of the robust content, and then you can get you can get help from if you went to college or university. You can get help from your alumni association. See what kind of assistance they can give you. And there's just a lot of complimentary um, help and services available to you. So, and then finally, boost your skills. It's never a bad idea. I get this question all the time is, do you think I should take a boot camp? Do you think I should take a course? Do you think I should take a webinar? Yes, yes, and yes. Analyze job descriptions that you're interested in by listing the required skills and experience and comparing that to your knowledge and your experience, and then making a decision about what type of um, class or webinar you can take 
There's tons of free online courses available through MOOCs, which stands for Massive Open Online Courses, through edX, which are courses from Harvard and MIT, Microsoft Khan Academy, and LinkedIn has you know, some versions of, of a lot of education as well. So then moving on, the next thing you want to do is kind of think about the job market. Um, do your research online. Um, on industries, on companies, and jobs. It can feel overwhelming to continually be looking at um, job specs and job postings. So I do believe that you're better off while you need to go online and do research, and we all do it, I think that you would be more um, productive by talking to people who actually know about a job or an industry or a company. And so that means, and we'll be getting jumping into networking, of course, I think those of you who know me know it's one of my favorite topics, but build a network if you don't have much of one and leverage the one that you do in order to go out and ask people questions informationally. And so just finding out which industries are expanding. I mean, right now we know supply chain, we know procurement, we know um, distribution, warehousing, um, retail, healthcare, travel, those are all the industries that got that got slammed during the pandemic. And those are, and there's many more hospitality, there's many industries, those are the industries that are now hiring quite a bit. Um, what are the jobs that companies are actually filling? <clears throat> and gather intel on, again, I mentioned this earlier, who's offering hybrid remote and who's flexible about it. So what does it take to succeed in a job search? Um, on the next slide, Basically, the first thing you want to do is do a self-assessment of your transferable skills. Um, the skills that I'm the skills that I'm talking about are kind of like the technical ones, the harder skills, you know. So things like data analysis, risk management, sales, those would all be technical skills. Um, your soft skills are extremely important um, because. Soft skills relate to whether or not you're going to fit into a company culture, um, how you're going to work well with people, um, with your manager and on teams. So those would be things like communication and negotiation and managing people. And then finally, digital and technical technology skills um, ranging from social media to CRM to um, Google, Google um, and at Microsoft Office, et cetera. And if you know what type of job you're looking for, then search for some job postings and see what they list as important. Write down your skills and compare and contrast. Set goals for your activity. Goals need to be really small, not huge. Like I wanna find a new job by September 1st, that's too big. So break it down because if you break down the activity, it'll lead you to you know, the big goal in the sky of getting a job. And then finally, I mentioned um, networking. So let's just pop over to talk, talking about writing a resume for a little bit. Um, as I mentioned, I do the uh, resume reviews for Cancer and Careers. Um, and last year, I reviewed 233 resumes. Um, not to mention all the resumes that I write in my own business, which I haven't counted lately, but I definitely write two, two or three a week. Um, so, and I see the same things over and over and over and over again, because the truth is, you know, you're not spending your life writing resumes. You're probably doing it two or three or four or five times in your lifetime. So people are always very apologetic that they don't know what they're doing that's just because you don't do it that often. So this next section just covers the content and the formatting that's necessary to include on your resume so that you get interviews. And that's really the job of a resume is to get an interview. You spend a lot of time writing and rewriting. And most of the time when people write out to reach out to me professionally and say, Julie, can you, I, I'll pay you, please write my resume. They're just fed up. Um, they're too close to it. Um, but know that nobody ever will examine your resume or scrutinize your resume the way you do. Um, yet it still has to have the right keywords and not have typos and all of those good things. So if ATS, and we'll get into ATS in a moment, I think most of you at this point might know what it is. If it ranks you high enough, someone will then probably spend 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds on your resume reading it when it gets to human. Um, so you want to avoid 
um, long paragraphs and sentences, big blocks of text, or even too little content is, is just as distracting. Um, always emphasizing past achievements and accomplishments. Do not speak in generalities. So the more that you can quantify your achievements or accomplishments, the better. So the person who reduced turnover by 25% in six months is much more impressive than one who merely reduced turnover. And on the next slide, a few more tips about writing an effective resume. Um, the only three-page resumes are for C-level execs. I write C-level C-level executive resumes in academic and science and medical. Two pages is the norm for everybody else. One page is for a recent college grad, um, although more and more I'm seeing college grads. I work with a lot of co recent college grads who um, they've had a ton of internships and a ton of part-time jobs, and they're, they're trying to kind of mimic the style that um, professionals use. And so sometimes they have like a page and a half or whatever. At the end of the day, we don't want to get hung up on length as long as it's not too long. Um, but you definitely want a profile or a summary. That's a, that's a paragraph that captures all the relevant information about you that a person needs to know with, if they never read the rest of your resume. So that would be, um, you know, th things that, that, I mean, that's the thing that everybody reads because it's the most interesting, the rest of the stuff isn't as fascinating. And that's where you have a little bit of leeway for some creativity to talk about, for example, some of your personal traits that have made you successful and have helped you stand out. Um, definitely you want 80% of your content to be accomplishments. So a little bit more about what you put on your resume on the next slide. Um, oh, let me skip to this. We, we mentioned the summary and the profile. This is an example for a marketing person. Marketing is very broad. This person has pretty broad experience. So they're talking about their, their product marketing and communications and social media experience. And then the fact that they can manage projects and get along with all sorts of stakeholders. So that's just a, a sample profile. And then the next slide is um, sample keywords. Um, you want your keywords to be words that are used in job postings. So this is not a place or time for you to make up words or be, you know, suddenly turn into a creative writer. They're going to be the words that, that most companies use. And even if your company or organization or a job you had had kind of strange language and there are industries and jobs like that, you want to translate that and use the more commonly used keywords because these are scanned and they're primarily technical terms, but definitely you can put some soft skills in here as well. Okay, so back to a couple more tips on writing an effective resume on the next slide. Um, you don't you don't want to say effective communicator. First of all, the hope is that once you've graduated from college, you're a pretty effective communicator. Not that we can't all get better. Um, Detail-oriented, I don't know. Um, you know, so something just a little sexier would be great, but not too crazy. Definitely, for those of you who have had cancer or survivors and you weren't able to work, perhaps, and you've been doing some volunteer or community service, even if it's in the cancer community, Definitely put it on your resume, but I think the mistake that I see people make is they might list their volunteer service. However, they don't um, necessarily get into any detail about what they actually did. So you achieve things in your volunteer and community service just as much as you would have in a job. And so it's really important to put that on your resume and, and kind of, you know, and, and also just the personal information I don't know why personal information isn't supposed to be on a resume. Right now, it's a trend that it isn't, unless it's something like running marathons, which leads someone to believe that you're very competitive, which could or may not be that great. I don't know. So I would just be very selective if you're going to include personal information. Definitely, I, what I do when I talk about remote or hybrid experience for my clients is I just put their job title and then the fact then dash remote or in parentheses remote or hybrid. You know, um, there's not too many people who have a, have been working over the last three or four years that that or three years, let's say that that haven't had that experience. But it's just a nice add-on, and you may have noticed that LinkedIn has added that as a feature where when you list your titles they ask you to specify whether your job is remote, hybrid, or on-site. 
A headline is really useful if it's specific and focused. It's just a place to either align with a job title of a job that you're applying for or to put uh, specific keywords just to add to the keyword power um, that needs to be on your resume. And then um, not putting dates with your education is fine if you're of a certain age, but you know anyone can Google you to find out how old you are anyway. So, um, but most people tend to leave off their their dates when they by the time they've turned forty or forty five. I've, I've observed. And then finally, just a visually appealing resume. Um, when I talk about ATS, I'll probably mention this again, but I do see a lot of these templates that people pull from online that have curly cues and color and images and graphs, and those are not scannable. Um, they get they confuse ATS, and so it's probably just a good idea to have a linear version with um, enough white space, decent size margins, and a readable font. And I listed some of the fonts that I, that are tend to be used on resumes, typically. So, okay, so let's jump into ATS a little bit in, in a more uh, deeper way. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's first, first talk about accomplishments. Accomplishment development. That's okay. So, yeah. Accomplishment development is um, is hard for people. It's really hard. People will often say to me, you know, I was an administrative assistant. I don't know what accomplishments I had. Well, it's unlikely that you've ever worked in a job, even if it was an entry level position where you didn't improve something, where you didn't change something, um, where you didn't eliminate waste or cost or um, where you didn't help people improve their productivity or their morale, even if you aren't a leader. So if you can just think about what you've done, um, you know, sort of start with what was the problem? What was the need? What was the situation? And then what did you do about it? And then what was the obstacle or barrier that you overcame? So that would be, you know, that it took too long to handle a certain process. And so you were able to shortcut that process by eliminating a couple of the uh, milestones or something, you know. Um, and then finally, the piece I talked about a little bit earlier, which is it's really powerful and impactful if you can quantify your uh, accomplishment with some sort of number. And I recognize you can't always do that. And sometimes you can just put an approximate number or percentage, and that's fine. It's not something people are going to check, and it isn't that you're making it up either. So, okay. So now we've talked about accomplishments. Let's now jump into the next slides <laughs> talks about ATS. Yes. So uh, I, you know, problem is I tend to jigger these slides around all the time. And I, I don't know why I do it because then I just confuse myself. Um, but optimizing your resume for ATS software. Um, so let me give you a, just a little explanation of ATS. So ATS is not just one type of software. Um, companies use all sorts of um, ATS. They, they buy it off the shelf, they buy it off the shelf, and then they have their IT um, department adjust it or you know optimize it in some way. They combine things, they grow homegrown ATS. So the challenge is there's not just one, and that would make life a lot easier for job seekers. Um, an automated ATS is designed to identify a very limited number of candidates who most closely match the specific uh, criteria for a position, which is identified through their internal algorithms. ATS is the foundation of the hiring process, I would say, easily in most medium and all large organizations. Um, ATS allows employers to indicate specific academic and professional credentials, and it ranks candidates on keywords and years of experience and sometimes education. So um, ATS, if you, uh, one more slide on ATS, um, moving on to the next slide. If you mimic the keywords, that's, that's what I recommend. And if you weave the keywords throughout your resume, the same keywords without looking like you're mimicking it, um, that's a really good strategy. So find three to five job descriptions for jobs that interest you and copy and paste those into a word cloud generator if you want, or do it manually. But word cloud generators are, are things like Wordle is a good example. And it will 
identify the keywords that are used frequently. Another thing you can do, not to make this too confusing, is if you go on LinkedIn and you go to the skills and endorsement section, um, the skills and endorsement section enables you to start sort of typing in a keyword. So I'll type in like a common one, data, D-A-T-A, and drop down all the common keywords will drop down. And you know then that those are keywords that are searched for. And so you can feel comfortable um, because LinkedIn is such a huge part of job search. You can feel comfortable using some of those keywords that drop down in the skills and endorsement section if you don't want to use something like a Wordle. So um, I always recommend on your resume to add a bulleted keyword section. Um, you saw the, the example that we showed on the earlier slide. Um, and then AT, and you can switch those out. So you don't, you're not just stuck with them because it's a word document, so you can change it. And then I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the creative templates that I see, ATS does get confused by the following, by tables, columns, borders, graphs, images, color, and odd bullets. So do not use those. Uh, and you can have a creative resume if you want to send email it to people, that's fine, but I wouldn't use it for online applications. Okay, so now let's move to everyone's favorite cover letters. People hate cover letters. I can't, if I had a dime for every time someone said to me, I hate writing cover letters, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. Although I would still be volunteering, of course, but I just think it's funny how much people hate these. And I just say, you know what? If, you, if they ask for it, you, you have to provide one. If they don't ask for it, I still recommend that you provide one because it's scanned along with your resume in the application process. And it's also a way for you to sell yourself. So, um, so believe it or not, someone's ringing my doorbell. So I guess I won't be answering that. I know who it is too. But anyway, be thoughtful about your subject line. Um, always mention something about the company in the first paragraph. Um, keep it brief and use bullets. Proofread your letter if you can. Um, and if you can find the person that you're um, sending, you know, or who would be the hiring authority for, for whatever the job is, try to follow up with them if possible. Odds are you're probably not going to get through to that person, but you should try. Okay, moving on to social media. Um, so, you know, Social media is ever evolving. Um, you're tweeting, if you're tweeting, you know, I don't know how many of you tweet. I mean, I do, but to be candid, I hire someone to help me with that. Um, if you wanna tweet, tweet. If you don't wanna tweet, don't tweet. I mean, you know, there's been a big shakeup as you're well aware over the last year or so with, with Twitter. Uh, following top industry leaders, I think is always a good idea because, um, it's it enables you to kind of, I like to learn about trends and what's going on and what are people saying and what are people thinking? And maybe you don't want any involvement with AI. It's the big thing right now, but it might be nice to learn a little bit about it. And the industry leaders are, you know, definitely thought leaders on many of those topics. Facebook. Um, yeah, I'm not a fan of Facebook. Yes, I'm on Facebook cursorily, but I, the thing with Facebook is there's billions and billions of links, photos, pieces of content um, that are shared on Facebook. So um, if you want a professional profile, I happen to have one just because I have my own business, keep it separate from your personal profile. And then this is really significant. I don't think enough people kind of monitor their digital reputation. So signing up for Google Alerts and Googling yourself regularly and, and updating all of your social media profiles, whatever you're, you're on, um, you know, trying to do that. You don't have to do it every month, but trying to do it regularly is a good idea. Employers and social media. Do employers use social media? Moving on to the next slide. Um, the answer is a resounding yes. In 2023, I would say all employers use social media in some way, shape, or form to screen candidates. Using social media prudently is more important than ever. And checking your social media accounts, I mean, most people don't have inappropriate content that much anymore. I'm hard pressed to see too much of that. 
Um, I think dating apps definitely have a lot of that, <laughs> but not social media accounts. So, so just, just be careful, just be cognizant, just be aware. And employers are looking. And that's all I wanted to say about that. And then um, in the next slide, just talking about your digital footprint. Um, just, we get this question a lot about, you know, as it relates to disclosure, um, if I'm volunteering for a cancer organization or jobs in the cancer community, what are these going to suggest to prospective employers? Are they going to find out that I've had cancer if I don't want them to? Um, what's going to be revealed in background or credit checks if, if you even are applying? Not all jobs require those, of course. And then just social media posts or blogs about your cancer diagnosis. I mean, that's the thing is it's, it's all over the place. The digital footprint is enormous. And so, you know, not putting your head in the sand and um, just paying attention to that is, is a really good idea. So we'll move to my favorite social media site, which is LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, I love LinkedIn because it's very, I don't love LinkedIn because of its interface or because I think it's fabulous or anything like that, but I do love LinkedIn as a tool. Um, I tend to use LinkedIn more for my my clients to help them with their networking and job search efforts. And I always offer to all of you who are listening to this, and I get many invitations from people who um, listen and watch uh, these webinars to connect with them. And I'm delighted to do that. And I really, really would welcome you um, to send me an invite after this webinar. But speaking of LinkedIn, if you're resistant, try to overcome that. Um, LinkedIn is the most widely used business-oriented social network in the world. Why it is, I have no idea. It started as a small IT community in 2004. There are 850 million people um, on LinkedIn. I'm not saying 850 million people are actively using LinkedIn, but it's a and it's not just a database. And that you know, and there's 75 million businesses on LinkedIn and 135,000 schools that have LinkedIn accounts. So most of my clients get contacted through LinkedIn for jobs. However, LinkedIn is not about making large numbers of contacts, um, but it's about meaningful relationships. I mean, it's it's harder to have meaningful relationships online than it is, you know, meeting someone for coffee. Um, but these relationships are in the forms of connections, which vary by degree. So your direct connections are first degrees, of course. Second connections um, are per people that are connected to your first degree connections, but not to you. And I suggest that you send an invitation to connect with anyone you talk to on LinkedIn, which will serve to refresh your memory about them moving forward and you can research and find them much more easily. So the days of, you know, business cards and Rolodexes or whatever else people use, Excel spreadsheets. Um, and, you, and by the way, speaking of Excel spreadsheets, you can download all of your LinkedIn connections onto Excel. And I recommend that you do that somewhat, you know, once or twice a year. Um, be sure to personalize your invitation when you send it rather than just clicking on the default invitation. And um, be sure to thoroughly update your LinkedIn profile and ask connections for recommendations. That's the, the one feature that people neglect the most, I would say, is they don't ask for recommendations. And that's a nice, colorful kind of, you know, I have a lot of recommendations. I'm due for some new ones, actually. But um, I, I just think they're enjoyable and interesting to read. Um, LinkedIn is so easy to use to keep up with people by looking at what they're doing, sending them quick little messages, and then you can move over to regular email. Um, and then just remembering to ask people on LinkedIn, just as you would in, in person, you know, is there anything I can do to help you? Um, and then a few more slides on LinkedIn. Your professional headline, this is my LinkedIn profile, um, your professional headline is important. Mine happens to just list the things I do, um, but you have room for 220 characters in your headline. Um, and that's, I don't, I don't use 220 characters, but if you want to, you can, because that's a place where you could be a little creative. Um, write a compelling, compelling profile, which is the about section. Uh, if you don't know what to put there and you've had 
you've had someone help you with your resume and you have a summary on your resume, you can just take that summary and put it there in your about section and slap on some specialties that are, you know, a substitute for keywords. And you have 2,600 characters available to you in the about section on LinkedIn. Um, definitely put a photo. I do, I'm doing a no-no on mine because I have a black background in my photo, but generally I recommend white. Um, and um, it doesn't need to be a professional headshot. It just happens that I have them, but um, you know, it can just be a little nice, a nice little photo that someone takes of you. And populate that. Remember, I was mentioning the skills and endorsement section earlier. That's where you can look up um, keywords and see what are used more commonly. That it, you have room for fifty there. So populate it with the full fifty. And you can you can say things in different ways. Like, um, let me think of an example, research, uh, data and analysis, data analysis, data analytics. That's a good example. So you can do that because, you know, co different companies use slightly different language when they're using keywords. And then on to the, on to the oh, I guess that's it for LinkedIn. So I think that's it for LinkedIn. So then moving on to, um, oh, no, I was wrong. So asking, see what I mean? I shouldn't move these slides around. Ask for substantive recommendations. I mentioned that already. I, I love recommendations. Um, if you want to post updates, you can. You don't have to. Um, I mostly just uh, repost articles that I think are interesting to my followers. And then um, join LinkedIn groups selectively and definitely personalize your LinkedIn URL. It's really easy to do that um, so that it's just your name or um, you know, it doesn't have that string of numbers and letters that makes it confusing and it'd be easier for people to search for you. So, okay. So now we're talking about introducing yourself, which is something that you know, kind of people feel a little uncomfortable about. I don't even like doing it. And I certainly like to talk and I'm not shy, but you want to be just a little bit interesting. So you're, you kind of want to be able to introduce yourself in 45 minutes to two minutes. And I still say elevator intro because I happen to live in a building in Connecticut that has two elevators. <laughs> so I'm in an elevator like every day, unless I'm brave and I live on the sixth floor and I, I climb down the stairs, which I do on occasion. Um, but your elevator pitch is kind of broken up. Like, what are you? What's your title? What's your industry? Because people do relate to that as boring as it sounds. What have you done or what can you do? So I, I could say something like, um, I've helped uh, 4,000 people improve their resumes. Well, that's pretty interesting. You know, people will stop and go, oh, wow, that's interesting. How'd you get into that? Or what, you know, how do you do that? You know, and then um, that could be the interesting thing, or you could add something interesting about yourself or something about your qualities or your personality, but definitely come across as confident when you, um, when you are introducing yourself. And if you can, humor is always a good thing. I mean, I think self-effacing humor is probably the safest brand, but um, if you can use humor, that's, that's a nice thing. So now we'll segue into networking. Networking. Um, so the stats with networking is that about 85% of jobs are found through networking. Now, I know I said to you a little bit earlier, well, most of my clients find their jobs through LinkedIn, and that is true. However, they may have started, seen a job um, posting, reached out to someone who knew someone at the company, then put in an online application, then loop back to the person that they knew. So that's networking. It's, you know, it's not just applying online and doing nothing else. 80% um, of, I mean, I've talked about hidden workers is also the hidden job market, which is 80% of jobs are in what's called the hidden job market. It means a company is not getting results in the way that they're, you know, posting jobs or they don't want to post a job or they don't want to deal with the process. And so they just kind of, um, if we find this kind of person or they talk to their internal employees um, and there, there's a, there's an opening. Um, definitely, uh, there's a, an author who's been around forever, Mark Victor Hansen, and he said, the average person knows 250 people at least. Each of those 250 people knows, knows 250 people. So then you have access to, believe it or not, 62,500 people. Um, so I don't expect you to know 62,500 people, but I, all I'm trying to say, the point is that you know many more people than you often think you do. And then finally, 30% of jobs are usually created through someone you know. So a little more about networking. 
networking is um, people are used to vir virtual networking. That's all we've been doing if we've been networking for the last two or three years. No doubt you've been contacted by people you haven't talked to in a really long time. Um, fortunately, virtual networking has enabled us to have a captive audience for messaging, emailing, video, and old school phone calls. I'm st I still try to talk people more recently into, will you just please just talk to me on the phone instead of having to get out, jump on Zoom? Um, you know, doing, doing 30 Zoom meetings a week can get get it wearing after a while. So, but everyone needs help with something. And that's a really important premise of, of networking. Um, so moving on to the next slide, the best way to fit networking into your life is, is to fit it into your life instead of, and making it a priority instead of um, thinking about it as an event that you will only participate in when you're looking for a job. So, um, and there's just some fundamental elements that are universal to networking, regardless of whether you're in, in a room in a conference or you're having a virtual coffee with someone you don't know very well. Um, and the one more key point is people do not network when they're working quite as often. And if this is true of you, you are working right now, and at some point you need to look for another job, it does become a little more uncomfortable to revisit your network than it would be if you had stayed connected with someone, uh, with people, even on a superficial level. So for me, I have created a habit for years of reaching out to someone at the beginning of the day and the end of the day, unless I'm traveling maybe, um, where I just say, hey, Scott, I we haven't talked. Um, what's up? What's going on? I see on LinkedIn. I said, what are you doing? You know, and it doesn't have to, there doesn't have to be an ask involved. It's just connecting, which I am a firm believer in. And I feel like it paves the way to easier conversations down the road. Um, and it's important for you to realize that most people are willing and interested in helping you if you can articulate exactly and specifically what you need and also approaching um, the networking process as a reciprocal process. So reciprocity is, in my opinion, the most important part of networking. So of course, you probably have an agenda if you're looking for a job. You need to find job openings. You need to meet people. You need to learn more about an industry. But your priority should always be on the other person. So before you meet with someone, just be clear about you know, your expertise, your skills, the kind of resource that you could be to that person, even if there, there's nothing that you can do to help them. The fact that you just communicate it to them and say, you know, um, I'd love to help you. I'm not sure how, if you can think of any way I'm here and that, and that would be great. And people really appreciate that. Um, a few more things about networking. Etiquette um, is very important. The, the pleases and the thank yous. I can't believe I still say that, but it, I'm shocked that people are I guess they're thankful, but maybe sometimes they forget. Um, always, you know, find a way to get back to that person. And maybe it's just thanks for your time. Or maybe it's like we spoke about um, this, you know, book book I read or this, you know, um, this podcast I heard. And then I wanted to forward the link to you. Um, keep your contacts and your notes updated digitally. I often talk about jibber jobber. It's um, a way for you to track your networking efforts and your job search efforts. And there's a free version and then there's a paid version. It's J-I-B-B-E-R, jobber, J-O-B-B-E-R. And um, just don't expect something from everybody. People are busy. They're distracted. They've got stuff going on. They don't know how to help you. Maybe they're not pro networking. Um, don't take it personally because you just absolutely can't have chemistry with, with everyone, especially virtually, I would say. So um, moving into, we're gonna get close to, to interviewing, but first I just briefly wanna talk about researching an employer. Um, so the things we've already talked about, researching the work, the type, the work format or the work, you know, the way you work, remote or hybrid, but also benefits. How have they treated employees in the past? Does the ADA apply given the size of a company? Have there been discrimination lawsuits that are that are public record? What kind of employee programs do they have? So most of that, most of that um, information is pretty easy to find. And again, to my earlier point of going to people and saying, what do you what do you think about the company and what they do for employees, you know, is a is a good way to learn. Um, when you're applying for jobs, you are often stuck, um, unless you're a CEO, you're often stuck applying online. So let's just touch on online applications briefly. 
on the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so I, these are my tips. I'm not gonna go through every, every bullet on the slide, but definitely practice first. So printing um, a sample application, try to avoid using autofill because that can the formatting can get a little crazy. Um, definitely cut and paste content. Um, tailor your the content on your application that you're filling out to match the keywords as well. And then this is a question we get a lot at Cancer and Careers. So if you choose not to answer one optional question, then don't answer any of the optional questions. Um, follow the company's instructions and definitely try to proofread everything if you can. So now um, interviewing. I mean, interviewing, we could talk about all day. The technology stuff, look, we all have snafus. Um, I've had many, you've had many. It's just the good idea is to test, especially before an interview, test everything. Um, make sure your battery's charged. Um, when you're on the, uh, if you're on a video interview, we do tend to interrupt each other because that's the nature of video because there's a bit of a delay or a lag. And so it's better if you can slow down and pause and don't speak unnecessarily and definitely exude more energy and speak more clearly so that you're um, better understood in a video interview. Preparing for an interview is real. I can't imagine going on an interview and not preparing. Um, so on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about preparation, which is um, preparing for an interview means, you know, the research piece that we spoke about. Definitely preparing and practicing answers to tough questions. So the, there will be a couple that I'll touch upon in this webinar, but um, bringing the job description to use as a cheat sheet. So when if you, especially if you're on video, you have it right there next to you. You can highlight everything. You can write down um, comparable uh, situations that occurred with you and your jobs as compared to what they're looking for in the job description. You can take notes, which is great and not feel funny about it. And then definitely tell stories. And this is just a little formula. It's kind of similar to what we were talking about with writing accomplishments. So what was the situation? What got in the way? What did you do about it? And what was the result? Which is that metric that I've mentioned a few times. When you're going into an interview, some things to remember about interviewing on the next slide. Try to keep composed, even if you get weird questions like what kind of animal would you be or what was the last book you read? I'm a voracious reader. I read like Goodreads told me I read like 62 books last year. I could not tell you the title of the last book I read. So I would probably feel flustered um, and I would have to find a creative way to answer it. But don't get flustered. Don't just keep composed. It's nothing personal. Definitely, um, instead of saying, I think I did that, say, here's how I approached it. So using assertive language, it's just as important to prepare really smart, thoughtful questions as it is to prepare smart, thoughtful answers or responses to questions. Um, it's a, I like the idea of um, oh, this is this is a really interesting point. Listening carefully to a question because there are people who ask multi-part questions. So Julie, tell me when you're going on an interview, is it important to do this? And then when, what happens if this happens? And then when do you do this? And I'm and you're kind of like all you hear is the last part of the question. So you want to kind of you know you're hopefully taking notes and you're kind of like paying attention to the three parts of the question. And then I'll, what I'll do is say, well, the first thing you asked is this. The second you asked is this, and the third is this. Um, and it also shows that you're listening. And then I would say, if you can summarize, you know, what we talked about today, Scott, is we talked about um, writing a resume, preparing for interviews, uh, negotiating compensation, this and this and this. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about before we wrap it up that you'd like to? And it's okay. You're being assertive and you're summarizing and you're reminding the interviewer of what you spoke about. And then avoid comp. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, talk briefly about that and and prepare to close the deal. I mean, more than just, I really want this job, but just, again, is there anything else we can talk about? Anything else you haven't asked me? Um, you don't always get an honest answer, but at least you can you can try. And then the gap question that Scott mentioned when we, we kicked this off today, the swivel, we call it, at Cancer and Careers on the next slide. So I was, I'd, I'd like to take 
accountability for developing this. I didn't, but I use it all the time. You talk about whatever it was that's the uncomfortable question, the elephant in the room, and then you swivel it or pivot it uh, to what you're so excited to be talking to them about today. So it's this happened, that happened, and what I'm so excited about and what I'm thrilled about and what I love about. And it's very positive and it ends everything on a positive note. And then I just touch on two of the tough questions. Tell me about yourself on the next slide. Um, this is where you're just giving a really brief, concise outline of who you are and what you've achieved. So I like the idea of going, um, going present, past, and future. So currently I'm doing this. Previously I did this. And what I'd like to do in the future is this. So notice the order, present, past, and future. Start by summarizing your current or most recent position. And then if you can throw in an achievement of some sort, because now you've done the work of creating achievements on your resume, then do that. The other tough question I wanted to talk about, which I don't know why all companies ask, is when have you failed, um, which is on the next slide. So when have you failed? So that you're just talking about something that was minor, focusing on what you learned from your missteps and the positive changes you made as a result. And it's okay to say, every once in a while, I still am working on that. Um, and then negotiation, the good news is about negotiation now is that, uh, first of all, you only do it when you have an offer on the table. That's it, the only time. You can do lots of research on all of these sites that are listed, salary.com, salaryexpert.com, et cetera. Avoid telling the interview how much you wanna earn as long as you can, if never, um, and pay transparency laws are pretty much going to be in place in every single state in the United States. Um, it requires that a company provides a salary range. And so at least you have a range to work with. Um, companies were kind of fibbing for a while, but now they're realizing they're getting nabbed for doing that. So that's not happening as much anymore. And then just a little bit more about um, negotiating your compensation package. One more slide, I believe. Never say yes or no until you're ready to do so, if you can negotiate comp on video if possible, as nerve wracking as that seems, that would be great, or at least on the phone. And um, just remember, there's a lot to working for an employer besides just a salary. There's lots that's involved in the package. Okay, I will turn it over to Scott. Thank you, Julie, so much. Uh, <laughs> before we get to Q&A, again, uh, we just have a few more slides here. Here are a few job source resource, job search resources. Again, you should have received this email, uh, the copy of the deck in your email this morning. If you didn't, we're happy to send you a copy. Uh, and then we have a few upcoming events. Our next webinar is going to be on July 12th, and that's going to be self-care. It's a really great presentation. Uh, hope that you can join us for some of these coming up. And then we have our national conference coming up in just a few weeks on Friday, June 23rd. That's a day long event also happening on Zoom. Uh, and there's really so going to be a really great day, lots of great speakers and panels and presentations. So we hope you can join us for that as well. Uh, I'm going to leave up the CE requirements here. Uh, the eval is actually going to pop up when the webinar closes today. So you can fill it out right away, or you'll get an email tomorrow with a link to it. Uh, so Julie, we'll ask you back here for a second. Uh, and again, if we don't get to your question, please shoot us an email, cancerandcareers at cew.org, uh, and we'll get you an answer one-on-one -on -one if we can't get you to get to you today. Uh, so Julie, the first question I have here. Mm -hmm. uh, feels timely. Do you recommend using AI resuming, resume writing tools or will ATS filter them out? Well, if you use AI, you're not going to use the final draft that AI created for you. So it's a fun game to start with AI with a cover letter, especially since they're so dreaded. Um, with a resume, you could try, but you're going to end up proofing and drafting and redrafting anyway. So it really has nothing to do with ATS. Yeah, we've been talking a lot here internally and we have a few blogs that we wrote a few weeks ago about, about AI and we feel like it's a really good way to brainstorm or get a first draft going, but you really want yeah. to fine tune and put your voice into things as well. Um, the next question I have here, 
is I've been looking for a job since February and most uh, applications ask the disability, which I know cancer was part of being defined as a disability. I know the question is optional, but does it reflect poorly on a candidate if they answer yes, or I prefer not to answer? Um, so I'm not a legal expert, so I'm a little, I, I, Scott, do you, would you be able to jump in on that one? I mean, I am not a lawyer either. <laughs> so I, I, that it's, it's supposed to be used for statistics, for gathering statistics. Um, but there's no guarantee that that wouldn't factor in in some way, shape or form. So if it's, it's, it's a personal choice that you, if you want to be honest, then be honest. If it makes you nervous, then avoid it. Yeah. And, you know, we, we recommend, like you talked about earlier, if you do say no to the disability question, it's probably a good idea to say, or I prefer not to answer, not no. Uh, you should probably say, I prefer not to answer for everything because you don't want just one question to right. draw true. attention to it or make them infer something that might not be true. Uh, but it really is just a personal preference uh, and how comfortable you are with disclosure. Uh, and, you know, we are actually technically out of time, but if anyone wants to stay on, I, we have, we'll- I'm game to go another two minutes if we're glad, because I know I use too much content, but if that's up to you, I know we're supposed to end, so- <laughs> So the, the last question I have for you here is, can you speak to tactics for overcoming ageism in the recruiting process? Well, so here's the deal. You can't change your age and you can't change a perception that someone has about someone who's of a certain age who might not be able to do something or may be able to do something, whatever it is. So I think it's just get really, really strong at, um, selling yourself, talking about your achievements, um, talking about your experience, relating it to the position that you're applying for, or interviewing for. So just get, just be top of your game with all of that versus focusing on ageism. Does it occur? Absolutely, ageism occurs. You know, but you can't do anything about it. Uh, I completely lied because I just saw one that just came in that I want to address before we go. Okay. Just to be our last one. Is how do you network with someone if you've sort of lost touch and haven't been in contact for a while? This is what I do. Dear Scott, we haven't talked in 16 years. How embarrassing. I noticed that you were doing this, that, and that. It looks so cool. Uh, I'd love to connect in some way, shape, or form. I just got a note like that on LinkedIn maybe two weeks ago from someone I worked with 10 years ago. And he was like, I don't know if you remember me, but right. we worked here together. And I was like, of course I remember you. There were four people in that office. Like, how are you? <laughs> I'm embarrassed right. to talk to you. I see your kids on Facebook. Like, I hope all is well, you know? Yep. It, it, and he was asking me for something to connect a, someone to someone else. And like, it was a favor he was asking for. And I felt totally fine even though I hadn't talked exactly about in 10 years yeah yeah and you don't have to say you're embarrassed but if you feel embarrassed you, you know say it <laughs> yeah I think it's the, taking that step kind of out of your comfort zone right that really is there's there's not far for you to fall yeah well Julie thank you so much this was once again wonderful and we're glad to have you, you here uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We hope you'll see you next month uh, for our self-care webinar or one of the other ones coming up this year. And uh, have a great day. Bye, everyone.